<coughs> Excuse me. What a way to start, huh? Anyway, this is Professor Long doing my anatomy and physiology lectures for my students at Delmar College. Anyone else uh, watching these videos might glean some useful information. Uh, nonetheless, um, this is Muscle Lecture 2, the second in the series. Uh, we're going to do the microscopic anatomy of uh, muscle tissue, the histology of the muscle, so we can understand how muscles contract in the next lecture. I did have some comments that I want, that people wanted to see a little bit more of me, and not just see my hands or my belly sticking off from the side. So um, I repositioned the camera. If I don't like it, I'm going to go back to showing just the marker board. Hopefully you can read and see. Anyway, so... If you follow along in the notes set, this is on the bottom of page 52. It's asking you to draw this out. You might need some more room. So nonetheless, when we look at a muscle, let's say we took the biceps muscle out of your arm and we cut it open. What we would see is that there's an outer connective tissue covering that surrounds the muscle. And the muscle itself is a bundle of smaller units. So when I look at a skeletal muscle, the outer connective tissue covering is a structure called the epimyceum. Epi means uppermost or outermost. The my comes from muscle. The em is membrane. So really it's just a big membrane of uh, connective tissue primarily. And inside of the muscle, if I look inside of it, there's some smaller structures that are bundled up. And they look like long tubular structures as well. So I'm actually, I might change that color a little bit. I don't know that orange shows up very well, but nonetheless, if I pulled one of these structures out like this, each one of these, I'm going to put a little letter F on them, is a structure called a fascicle. So a muscle is a bundle of fascicles. And a fascicle has an outer connective tissue covering. And this connective tissue covering is called the perimyceum for a perimeter. So the perimyceum is made out of the exact same tissue as the epimyceum. They're the same stuff, but one is wrapped around a smaller structure called a fascicle. And if I take several fascicles, just like me taking several of these markers, if I were to wrap something around them, then I would have a muscle. The outer covering would be the uh, epimyceum. The plastic of the marker would be the perimyceum, and each marker would be a fascicle. I'd have a bundle of those. Now, when we look at a fascicle, fascicle is a bundle of smaller structures. So when I look inside the fascicle, I'm going to see these smaller units inside of it. Now, if I pulled one of these out and make it a little bit bigger than the others just so you can see it, this structure is called a myofiber which is a muscle cell or a muscle fiber. It goes by three names, muscle cell, muscle fiber, myofiber. You know, most cells, if we were to magnify them like we did in lab and look at them, most cells would be about the size of my thumbnail when magnified, you know, 400 times or so. Well, muscle fibers are long, narrow cells, so originally they thought they were fibers like the fibers of a rope. Later on, I think someone figured out uh, histologically that they were actual cells with many nuclei and a lot of the organelles. So the word muscle fiber morphed into muscle cell. Um, they're the same thing. Now, just like any cell, it has a cell membrane. But because the properties of muscle cells, muscles fall into a, a category of cells called excitable cells. The cell membrane of excitable cells is very similar to other cells, it's a lipid bilayer with proteins and carbohydrates and cholesterol and other things associated with it. But excitable cells have a lot of what we call gated channels, little integral membrane proteins that act as like tunnels that things can flow through. And some of them are gated in that they can open and close and allow things to flow through or not. So excitable cells have a lot of these gated channels. And because the cell membrane of a muscle cell is a little bit unique, Compared to other cells, the cell membrane of the muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. Now, 
Outside of each muscle cell, there's another connective tissue covering that surrounds the muscle cell. It's made out of the same stuff as the epi and perimysium. And so if I were to draw this around this, there's a lot of different connective tissue fibers, a lot of collagen fibers and other things going in all these different directions. And each individual muscle cell is individually wrapped. So now, imagine if this marker were a muscle cell and the marker itself has a connective tissue covering or actually has a sarcolemma, the cell membrane. If I could wrap this with a piece of paper, then that would be the connective tissue covering surrounding each individual cell. That connective tissue covering of each individual cell is called the endomycium. So we actually have three layers of the connective tissue covering, epi, peri, and endomycium, all made out of the exact same stuff. If I take the perimycium, I'm sorry, the epimycium, and wrap it around a bunch of smaller structures called fascicles, I get a muscle. So a muscle is a bundle of fascicles. The fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells or myofibers or myo, um, sorry, myofiber muscle cell or muscle fiber. And the connective tissue covering surrounding the fascicle is perimycium. Each individual muscle cell has its own cell membrane called the sarcolemma, and outside the cell membrane is a sleeve that sort of surrounds it or individually wraps it called the endomycium. Turns out the endomycium has two major functions that we're going to discuss. Number one, it, individual, it, it isolates or electrically insulates each skeletal muscle cell from each other. So if a bunch of people were touching skin to skin and several of us were, were touching each other, imagine if I took 100 people in um, bathing suits, you know, uh, Speedos and bikinis, and we were all standing crammed into, a, say, a phone booth or some small space. If one person licks their fingers and sticks them in a socket, please don't do that. It will kill you. But if someone got shocked, if someone got tased, then everybody would feel that voltage it would shock one person and then pass through contact to the next, to the next, to the next. If everybody put a giant rubber suit on and then we crammed you all together and I could tase one person, that person would, con their muscles would contract. And the people around them might feel them contracting, but they wouldn't feel the voltage and their muscles would not contract because we were insulated by that rubber suit. And that's kind of what the endomycium does. Connective tissue does not conduct electricity very well. So if I were to go and shock this muscle cell and cause it to contract, the other muscle cells surrounding it would feel the contraction, but they wouldn't feel the voltage. They wouldn't contract by themselves. The second major function is this endomycium from each muscle cell, as they come down towards the end of the muscle, because each muscle cell runs the entire length of the fascicle, they are somewhat tied together at the end. It would almost be like me taking, you know, several ponytails if I still had long hair like I used to and braided ponytails. And then I braided the ponytails together. Each individual muscle cell is braided sort of together at the end of the fascicle with each other so that they're all pulling on the same piece of connective tissue at the end. And that connective tissue, since it's the same as the perimysium, is all woven together. And all of the fascicles are somewhat woven together into the peri um, epimysium. Sorry. And at the end of the muscle, all those connective tissue coverings that fan out through here form a tendon. Essentially what happens then is when a skeletal muscle cell contracts and pulls on its endomysium, it's pulling on the end of the fascicle, and it's pulling on the tendon at the end of the muscle. Later on, we're going to see how that allows us to increase tension in a muscle. There will be several ways that we can do that, two ways that we can increase tension in a muscle. And one of them is going to be to increase the number of muscle cells pulling on the tendon. As a little side drawing over here, let me show you. If I were trying to pull a car, let's say a car is stuck somewhere. I could have a person pulling on a rope. If I had another person with another rope and I braided those ropes together, then each one of them could provide 50% of the force on this piece right here, which would then be applying pressure to the car. If one person pulls, I only get 50% of the force. If the second person pulls, I can get 100% of the force. And of course, 
the more people I have, <clears throat> the less force each one could generate overall, and the more control I would have over the muscle. That's exactly what's happening here. Each muscle cell is like a little person pulling on its own individual endomycium, but then they're all woven together into a peri and an epimycium that forms the tendon connected to the bone. I hope that makes sense to you. Anyway, so now um, we understand somewhat some of this structure. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase a lot of the information, and I'm going to show you a little bit more detail. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this video in a few minutes. I may not get to finish everything, and I may have to make a third video. As I've stated before, managing the size of the files becomes an issue. But if I look inside a muscle cell, so now I have my muscle, my fascicle, and my individual muscle cell with its sarcolemma. Okay? Inside the muscle cell, there are smaller subunits that happen to be called myofibrils. So a muscle is a bundle of fascicles, a fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells, and each muscle cell is a bundle of smaller units. All these long tubular structures that are made almost entirely out of protein called a myofibril. Now, one of the things that I know about the myofibrils is that they don't have any kind of connective tissue covering or anything wrapped around them. It really looks like a long tube. Essentially, though, a myofibril is a bundle of smaller structures. And there's these little tiny proteins. If I look on the end of a myofibril, let me draw this one a little bit bigger. There's a bunch of little proteins in here that are like little stick-like proteins running the length of this myofibril. They'll be interrupted by these little lines or these other plates of proteins, but these repeating units are going to last the entire length of each one of these myofibrils. There's a second protein mixed in here. I'm going to try to color code it like our textbook does. So I'm going to try to use purple and pink or purple and red. But these proteins are sort of interspersed with each other this way. So if I look on the end of the myofibril, and I didn't draw this anatomically correct, the way that it's uniquely arranged, but nonetheless, what I see is I'll see these little red proteins and then these purple proteins and then the red ones and the purple ones, and they're going to repeat throughout the length of a myofibril. I'm going to draw one more of these. I'm going to take this myofibril out, and I'm going to run it all the way through here as if it was running through the muscle cell. <clears throat> so, essentially, I'm going to have these little red stick-like proteins, and they're really not even solid. It's not a solid circle. I can have a protein here, a protein here, a protein here, one here, and some more over here. Okay. They usually actually organize themselves in groups of six in a very unique arrangement. And then they kind of end, and then there'll be another grouping of them like this that are connected by a series of other proteins, and then some will stick off this way. And we have these repeating units. Maybe this is the end of our myofibro. I didn't draw exactly everything perfectly and matched up, but you'll get the idea. There's another plate-like protein that really kind of runs around here, and it's a bunch of proteins that are interconnected. And sticking off of this plate, there's this other purple-looking protein. In reality, they're not pink and purple, but these are the colors we assign to them. Everywhere that I see one of these lines would be one of these solid 3D plates, and these would be in the middle here, and there would be three of them surrounding every one of these other red proteins. We'll get into that structure in a little bit. Okay. You can see these repeating subunits, the structure from here to here to here, and they would continue to repeat all down the length of each individual myofibril. The proteins that make up the myofibril the two proteins found in here are called actin, or the thin filament, 
And your book will use the term myofilament and filament in interchangeably. Myofilament comes from the word muscle, myo. And the purple one is referred to as the thick filament. And it's primarily made up of a protein called myosin. So we have two myofilaments or two filaments that make up myofibrils. There are other proteins involved, actin and titan and connectin. I mean, titan and connectin and some others. But we're going to focus on these for the time being. So one myofibril, this long tubular uh, arrangement of these two proteins or myofilaments called actin and myosin or the thin and thick filament. Now, technically, the thin filament is made up primarily of actin, but I will use the terms interchangeably. And the thick filament is made up primarily of myosin, but I'll use the terms interchangeably. As these proteins are arranged in a certain pattern, and that pattern repeats down every myofibril, what we're going to see is that these two proteins are going to slide together. In a moment, we're going to look at the structure of actin and myosin from a microscopic or molecular level, I should say. And we're going to learn that the myosin filaments are going to reach out and grab onto an actin filament and pull it. And what they'll do is they'll pull towards this solid line in the middle. It's called an M line for middle. And these little zigzag shaped lines are going to be called Z lines. We're going to draw the structure out in the next video. And what's going to happen is when the myosin filaments grab the actin filaments and pull, it will pull the Z lines closer together shortening one of these subunits called a sarcomere. If I shorten this one this much, which would pull this one over and shorten it, which would pull this one over and shorten it, the entire myofibril shortens when these proteins slide across each other. It's what we call the sliding filament theory in uh, muscle contraction. And as each myofibril contracts, the muscle cell contracts and pulls on its endomycium which pulls on the perimycium at the end of the fascicles, which pulls on the tendon at the end of the epimycium of the entire muscle. So it's really these protein interactions, the sliding filament theory, where these two myofilaments slide across each other, causing the muscle to contract. We're going to look at the molecular structure of these proteins in the next video. It'll be muscle video three. Um, so I hope you learned something here. hope that this was helpful and you understand somewhat of the um, anatomy or structure of a skeletal muscle. And every one of the skeletal muscles that we've been learning in lab, flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, brachialis, biceps brachii, brachialis, triceps brachii, brachioradialis, all of these muscles, rectus femoris, they all have this structure. This is the structure of skeletal muscle. All right. All right. Hope you had as much fun as I did. Another video coming soon.